Hey everybody, welcome back to X's for Podcast. This is the Daily X, where we bring you news, information, and discussions about your favorite Marvel comics, most notably the X-Men. I'm Nico, and you guys can find me at Nico Action on Twitter and Instagram. That's N-I-C-O-A-C-T-I-O-N. And in this next segment, Rod, Raven, and Dante bring it down on X-Core. Teeny Howard has been weaving an incredible story across multiple titles in the X-Office, and X-Core is no different. This issue was a part of the Amazing Hellfire Gala, which ran the entire month of June over in the X-Office. We hope you guys like and subscribe if you do. And until next time, we'll see ya. Hello, welcome to the next segment of X's for Podcast. I am Rod Savage. That's a new thing that I'm working with. It's fine. Wow. Um, you can find me at, at Rod, comma, the, on Twitter and Instagram. And today we have with us the dangerous Dante. Hey, everyone. This is Dante. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Inferno Magic. That's magic with a K. And also with us today is Raven. Hello. It's Raven, a.k.a. Jane Red Bento. I know your wonderful player. Art ho, auntie. How are you doing, guys? <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. So today we we're talking about the very professional business of X Corp issue two by Tini Howard is the writer, Alberto Fo is the artist, Sunny Gao is the color artist, and VC's Clayton Cowles is the letter. X Corp issue two definitely had a place in the gala. It was mm -hmm. mainly in the gala. I actually like like how they did incorporate X Corp into the gala. It was nice. Um, we still don't like me and me and Dante talked about this kind of in the green room chat. <laughs> um, like, what is the purpose of X Corp? And because you know we have the Hellfire Gap. I mean, not have the Hellfire Club. Um, mm -hmm. You know, giving the medicine or the standard medicine to the human population and saving the mutants standard mutants and all that what is x corp doing and we were like well x corp was a thing for a mutant business before krakoa and now they're incorporating it again to try to make different medicines and different things so they can make even more money and more business for you know the mutant nation so i think that's why they made you know jamie madrox a doctor in like a month as they said in this issue which is the fastest program i think anyone's ever used to become a doctor <laughs> I just want to know what that looked like. Right. Like, do you just make a room of 30 and we all sit down for the lecture or do you divide them up and they're each learning different things and then you have to reabsorb them. So you reabsorb all that knowledge. Like technically, yeah, he could have done four to seven years worth of work in say a month or so. It yeah. would have been exhausting though. I'm just, just saying, just saying, but, but it is technically uh, doable with his cloning abilities. What I don't like though, is you still have the, the one, you know, the, the lead, <laughs> yeah. the original who is the doctor and yet all of his clones are treated like staff like like the help and it's really kind of disturbing on a lot of levels when he um disciplines one of his clones at at the gala and just yeah just absorbs him back up yeah. yeah, and then and then tells the next clone, you know, if you want the same, keep staring. I'm like, ooh, sir, this this has some antebellum South kind of shit going on here. Like, <laughs> Ugh, bad luck, bad luck, no. Yeah, I would say if you want a deeper insight of how Jamie Maltrox, um is like with his clones and all of that, definitely me, definitely read Matthew Rosenberg's. Um, one through five issue of Multiple mm -hmm. Man. That's a real good insight of kind of who he is, kind of in a way. Also, obviously, his past X Factor run that he was in oh, and leading yeah. of. Obviously, you get a big deeper insight of who he is reading that as well. <laughs> True. True. But yeah, yeah, Jamie's a doctor now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it feels like it's a sorry. Just just to jump in with the with the Jamie chatter is it feels like a big departure from how he's been written before. And I I don't know like how long it's been that way, but I mean there was a long period where every dupe that he created essentially was an aspect of his personality and like went off and you know did their own thing. I mean they were living their own lives at one point, and so like I'm not sure when that shifted anymore but I don't I don't like it either like I I really enjoyed when it was 
like you almost couldn't tell who the real Jamie was anymore. You know, like to me, that makes way more sense. But I mean, if this is the progression of the character, if that's how he's been written more recently, like that's fine, I guess. Um, but I don't, I don't love it. I loved Jamie. I, I think it is it Peter David's X Factor. Like that's when I really, really loved Jamie Madrox. Like. X Factor Investigations. Um, I thought that was just like, it was really great uh, character building for him. This feels lesser, unfortunately. I just, yeah, I just don't love it as much. Yeah, I, would, I feel like he turned this way definitely because of what happened to him in Matthew Rosenberg's Multiple Man, which is a good series, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you definitely learn why he's more like this with his dupes now yeah. um, based on what happened because like a lot of shit happened. <laughs> so for, for y'all and for the listeners who haven't read it um definitely read it because yeah, you know, that, that, that's a fair assessment that is a fair assessment but yeah i, I like how um i like how trinary calls him out and is like don't you have a wife and a child and like where's where where are they he's like you, he's like, you shut up. <laughs> right? I was like, oh. I mean, Trinary is all of us, right? Like, I've been asking those questions, too. Like, where is Same. Layla Miller? You know, like, mm -hmm. How ridiculous is it? You know, like, he's... Jamie Madrox is such an integral part of Krakoa. I mean, you see him working <laughs> everywhere. Staffing everything. Every event. Every establishment. Like, he is kind of the backbone of Krakoa. So, like, where's his family? Like, give us more Jamie. And uh, mm. ho hopefully we, we'll look get more of him but i, guess I would love now. to see more of his family yeah i really would speaking of you know the mutant family and everything we get a lot of obviously monet and angel but i love that because we don't get to see a lot of psychics kind of playing around with this getting in people's personal space and personal privacy and she's in his head while he's in the shower and she's like oh she can my see God. everything i'm just like monet does not care <laughs> But that seemed kind of like a, a weird departure for her because I don't I don't quite remember her being this invasive with her mental power. Like she just she just dives right. On. I felt like I almost felt like calling her you know Charles Xavier for a while um, with the way she just kind of dives into people's minds lately and like oh, excuse me I'm in the shower yeah, yeah, yeah I've got other things to do. I'm sorry is is this the Charles Xavier school for? gifted psychopaths what is wrong with you but you know in all fairness like angel's pretty shameless anyway like it's not like he's actually oh, yeah. bothered by it like he's he's a pretty boy he knows it he likes to flaunt it anyway so <laughs> i'm sure there's a part of him True. that kind of enjoys the attention yeah i mean there's definitely i don't know if, i don't know if i really sense it in this book but i'm assuming there's probably sexual tension between them two they're both beautiful people. <laughs> well, no, no, no. What sexual tension? I know. They it's not there. Be, they are, it's not oh, there. they are so, like, they are so dry. It's like, we're talking there. about the Gobi and the Sahara, you know. They're both <laughs> deserts. They do their thing. Like, I don't feel any tension between them. And that's that's the weird part, I guess. Because yeah. it's like, she is treating literally every single exchange like it is a transaction. And, like, there's not any sort of empathy behind anything she's doing which i'm just i'm watching her set of dominoes and i'm just going like okay i get why she's doing it because some of it is really very much about you know creating the optics that you want to see and x, x corp i think is, is is exactly what it says it's it's a corporation it just happens to be run and staffed by mutants and, and it, it shows in the way they kind of interact at the gala and with each other and, and with these emissaries and ambassadors and whatnot. Like, everybody has their role and you better fill it and make sure the optics look good and here's some espionage. And I'm like, they really are like a corporation. Oh, definitely. I mean, I feel like Monet is good for that because, you know, she has kind of the stern, you know, no bullshit kind of attitude, especially with like her face. And she's just like, I'm going to get the shit done. You know, she's like, I am serious and I am mean and I'm going to get this shit done. Or if you don't let me, I'm going to kill you. And that's just how she, I mean, we see that in this story. <laughs> Uh, thankfully towards racists and not like actual good people. <laughs> oh, <Right>. oh. <laughs> but before we get to that part <laughs> why, why are they allowed that's what I want to know. Why are they allowed on Krakoa at I, fucking I think, all? I think they're allowed just because I mean the same way Apocalypse and Sinister were allowed. Just because it's a clean slate for all mutants. Everyone's giving like a third or fourth or tenth chance. Like this yeah. is the final chance. Yeah. Final chance. I know. <laughs> okay. 
But I'm going deep me. in there. Bitch. Like up to the up to the show. Bitch. No they one had wants them. They man. had they had their second chance when they were resurrected. How they have not been murdered since oh, then, yeah. I don't know. Like oh, definitely. Oh my god, they are horrible people. And oh, oh, at the people they are talking to. Ha! Huh, oh, they were so step forty, and I'm like, mm-hmm, girl, Molly, you in danger. <laughs> <laughs> I am a little bit confused with, with Fenris for one reason. I can't remember what issue it is now, but I feel like earlier in the gala, in one of the other gala issues, we saw them toasting with Emma and the Hellfire Trading Club. Do you remember that scene? I feel yes. like Fenris was there as part of the toast. And I was like, Fenris, why are they there? Unless, I mean, unless I, you know, mistook them for someone else. But, you know, that made me think, oh, maybe they're getting involved with Hellfire. And then x kind of threw me off because it was like, like, oh, they like they're trying to well, weasel their way around places. So I don't know what's happening. Technically, there. technically, they are in the Hellfire Club because Shaw yes. inducted them in, um, which without, I find hilarious. Yeah, uh, without Emma's knowledge. So technically, they are a part of it, but none of them, no one wants them there. Like we see, even in the I forget, I think it was Cable or New Mutants when they were fighting in the Crucible for someone. Um, the Fenris twins were there and like someone was like, We don't even, no one even likes you. You know, it was Marauders. It, okay, was, it was Marauders, marauders. Okay. when Callisto is going into the crucible That's and she's right. the Fenris twins stand up and she's like, Look, I would like to be reborn. I don't want to be in the hole for the rest of my life. Like and she was right. Like if, if the Fenris twins had stepped in, she wouldn't have gone, Oh, okay, I'm gonna go light on my power. No, nah, she would have done everything she had in her like shake, 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 shake. Shink, 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 It's like, listen, definitely. they're dead. You're shanking soup at this point. <laughs> Stop. No, I they're, definitely get oh, that. They're so horrible. They're so, I hate and them. luckily, they got their comeuppance in this book. But more of the people that we kind of like, except for like one of them that was a human, unfortunately. The, <laughs> they had the Hellfire Gala meeting schedule. <laughs> like, this party wasn't all fun and games for some people. They actually had meetings. And Mm -hmm. I do like the first one that they see, because we haven't seen him in a hot minute, basically since Extreme X-Men. I mean, we saw him a little bit since then, but his Mm -hmm. bigger spot was in Extreme X-Men. It was Neil uh, Shira, Shira, I think that's how you say it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, aka Thunderbird, the other Thunderbird. (laughs) And I do like that he's in there because... Like I've said this in other uh, other episodes that we should have more Asian representation in the mutants mm-hmm. on Krakoa. Like we have a lot of white American mutants, so right. are Russian. So we need other, you know, representation of races in mutant because I mean mutants mm-hmm. are all over the world and they're being born and reborn from all mm-hmm. like of other cultures as well. We need to mm-hmm. see them. So I'm glad we Absolutely. are. Yeah, no, I am. I'm dead on straight up with you. I loved how much non-white representation there actually was in this book between Trinary, Sunspot, uh, Thunderbird, Monet. Like, we got to actually see a lot of good representation Mm -hmm. across the board. It was fabulous. Oh my god. So, so, so many despicable people here. Speaking of (laughs) despicable and fabulous, Celine is here. Oh, (laughs) right. I'm like... (laughs) Oh, she's the bad guy. I'm supposed to hate her. Oh, God, I love her outfit. (laughs) Dante, what did you think about Celine showing up in the meeting? I'm torn. Like, I love the interaction. Like, she's a good character for kind of playing with the devil a little bit. You know, like, she's she makes sense in a lot of ways to, to bring into the business. But there's something about her, like, that I just never can trust, though. Like, how can you... How... Can you get into business with someone like that? Like, I feel like every time we see Celine, she's always doing something, you know, that only really works out for her. So I don't know. But I mean, it was kind of fun to see her kind of toying around with Angel and and teasing him a little bit. So I'm excited to see where it goes. But I, I just can't remember, like, I feel like she's she's had some other appearances recently, and it, it I feel like what's been going on with Celine has been really questionable uh, outside of Krak- Krakoa. And so I'm wondering how that's if that's going to play into her getting involved with Equor at all. 
they did. I'm, I'm glad they did mention that in a little synopsis because I was I've been wondering that too because I know she's in Captain America. Or at least she was for like a hot minute, like disrupting his like I don't know his story or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's good. It's written by Tom Coates, Coat, so I'm sure it's good. I'm gonna wait to trade weight it because it's just I waited too long. Um, but yeah, she's in there not being good. But yeah, she said there are some pretty nasty rumors about what she's been up to when she's been away from Krakoa. Really nasty. I know she was like killing people or whatever. So I'm like, why is she not in the hall? I guess because no one told on her. <laughs> like, and also, Apocalypse killed her recently and then she got brought back. So I guess it kind of was like whatever. But I don't know. Well, Celine is really, really, really good at what she does. Mm-hmm. And and I mean, she can find every loophole, every technicality. She is smooth. She is like, like I don't trust Sebastian Shaw. If his ass is not literally stapled to that <laughs> wheelchair <laughs> for the rest of it, I, I, mm, I don't even trust him in the chair. Okay, I don't. I wouldn't trust her unless she was buried at the center of the earth with her head in my hand, her body somewhere else. And even then, I want cameras on both of them at all points in time because I don't trust this bitch. Like, she's too good at what she does. Just say it. Just she's say it. a lot. I mean, she had a whole event because oh, of yeah. that. Okay. So, like, she's a force to be reckoned with. And we definitely mm-hmm. haven't seen the last of her. I wouldn't mind her, actually, probably on the x Corp Council because, like, she would be probably good for the mutant business. Like, honestly, oh, yeah. she would scare the shit out of corporations, like the CEOs and shit. So, mm-hmm. hey, and she, I mean, easy to kill people, but you're not supposed to kill mu- humans. So that's hey, the law. Hey, supposedly. if they fall off their yacht in international waters and their body is never found, that is not her fault. If a body dies if, in an open if, ocean, if, is it, are they really dead? Right. <laughs> I mean, they slipped and fell. The pool boy tried to help them but you know shit happens <laughs> but you know we move on from the meetings that are fun mm-hmm. and a little hijinks and everything and right we already brought the finish tins but i'm glad <laughs> that this is like i feel like the um the conclusion of them or at least of what they've been <laughs> oh, no uh, not probably not the conclusion but no. at least like what they've been doing so far because i like that all the mutants even mastermind comes together and is like, fuck them. Even Clint Quire's like, fuck them. <laughs> when you can get the biggest assholes of Krakoa to agree with you, to just go, fuck them, let's fuck their shit up. Yeah, yeah, you know you're an asshole. <laughs> the, the fact that I liked Quentin Choir a little bit more after this, oh lord. I've liked him a lot during this whole Krakoa era. He's he's grown on me a lot. Right? Oh my goodness. But yeah, no, like, she straight up, like, oh man. They straight up went ahead and went with the, you know, the Stepford wife meets Sabrina, the freaking middle-aged bitch. And just, <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, they've, they've gone with the competition, which could be very, very, very bad news. Um, especially since they're working with Shaw, and Shaw has a bone to pick with Emma. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm really glad that you guys reminded me that they actually were part of um, the Black King's inner circle. Like that, because that to me gives, it gives more credence to what they're doing. They're scheming. And I mean, there's a good chance that they could be scheming for Shaw. I mean, we know he's not happy with things the way they are. Uh, even though we're not seeing him in x Corps. I mean, they very well could be still working and doing, you know, something that's going to benefit him. Um, I mean, which is, of course, the reason why he, he would align himself with, with the Fenris one when nobody else wants to deal with them so i mean if he can find value in them i'm sure he'll use them even if you know and, or they could be a complete misdirect because everybody doesn't trust them and so that like kind of takes the heat off of shaw so yeah the yeah. enemy of my enemy is my friend mm-hmm. well and i mean I'm, I'm i'm pretty sure that monet has at least in this one taken care of one of them yeah it looks like both of them have been taken care of for the most part angel and monet mm-hmm. are forces to be reckoned with but oh, yeah. like, speaking of Angel's whole debacle, like Dante, what did you think of Mastermind coming back? Because we last time we saw him, he was like dealing with sinister and aliens, and then he got free from that, and like he's on Krakoa again now. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because I feel like he is he's one of those characters that can easily uh, weave in and out of situations. I mean, his power basically gives him that ability to to not let anything stick. He can kind of mess around with stuff and you know move scot free. So I it's it's nice to see that you know he he showed up in one comic and is still getting used in another. Um, you know it brings that sense of cohesiveness. You you know the Krakoan era. Um, but I I think the use of Mastermind in this issue is really interesting because I think like obviously you know we, we we've, you've said it before this this comic is about optic and obviously both of our our CXOs have things to hide and. You know, like I, it was it was a brilliant move uh, and a great power move for Mastermind to show how he can be useful uh, to Angel, who apparently doesn't have full control over his transformation. Like I think I think that's kind of huge, you know, and like especially in an era where it feels like everybody is uh, happy and celebrated, and you know we're like, gay mutants um, and embracing you know mutant powers, but like I I think Angel and I think Monet to a degree as well are having trouble controlling controlling those powers. They can't control their anger. That's that's why in the beginning, like the the promotion poster of Reign of X, you see Angel and Monet with each other, both their halves of their selves, both of their different like destructive personalities are more violent personalities because it just comes out. Like that's part of their mutant power. That's, I feel like that kind of brings back to um, what was said in like Hox Pox. It's like a lot of mutants can't control like how they were in their past because of their behavior, like Mystique or Sabretooth or something like that, because their mutant power provokes them to do those certain things. Like it, mm-hmm. it influences their behavior. You know, so that could be the same thing for Angel and Monet because they both, that wasn't their standard powers at first, but now they developed those powers or were given those powers in a sort of sense. So now it is a part of their mutant ability and it's influencing them. I mean, it's both for both of them, it's influenced their whole lives. So for better or for worse. I, I kind of, uh, I like the fact that they've been made to run the corporation because, I mean, very much like we've been saying, it's about optics, it's about the look. Well, that's exceedingly true of those two. Their forward face that most of the public sees is Monet and, and Warren. Very nice, perfectly coiffed, beautifully put together. Um, but who they are at the core could be a little bit more amoral and ugly and, and, and vicious, um, and their their inner selves that we only get to see are very reminiscent of some of their scariest and most violent times, like mm. when Archangel was was part of uh, Apocalypse's Four Horsemen. He was terrifying. <laughs> it was terrifying. And now, yes, he has that under control and he has his regular wings back, but I mean, it's still there. It's always going to be in the surface. And Monet, when she goes full penance, she loses a lot of uh, uh, the critical thinking skills, we'll call it. And and it's just this vicious, violent, you know, searching for vengeance creature, practically. So, yeah. No, it makes absolute sense that these two-faced mutants are corporation leaders <laughs> it does it does they they fit the mo and it makes sense that for the board of directors they hire or they make mastermind the the other cxo because he is good for business and he can also make illusions so we can you know better corporate meetings or what have you you know like that's think of how many business owners or ceos or whatever would want to have mastermind's power it's scary because it's not a great power to have if you're doing that. It's very manipulative. But my question for y'all would be, who would you want to be in the spot of the next CXO? And I'm assuming, I guess, the chairperson as well. I don't know. It's all blacked out. So I don't know if they're going to actually put someone there. But the CXO definitely is going to have somebody soon. I'm I'm trying to think of someone who would like fit mm. that that kind of uh, being able to manipulate large crowds really well spoken. Um, thank God it's not going to be sinister because <laughs> no, I don't think anyone would want that. <laughs> I don't think even sinister would want that. It's too much. It's too much. I'm sure one of his clones would, but you know, (laughs) yeah, like, yeah, no, that'd be frightening if somebody like Sinister was. But I'm like, I mean, I know precogs aren't allowed on Krakoa, but could they allow a precog on the board of x Somebody who could predict what uh, business 
uh, rivals might do or how, I don't know, what, what the next day is going to look like. Are we going to need more of one product or less of another product or, you know, where could it go wrong? Like, could they put somebody like that in there? I don't know. What precogs are alive? Because they're not going to bring anybody back. It'd have to be somebody that's already alive. <laughs> I was about to say, bring back Madeline Pryor. No, wait. <laughs> uh, Dante, who do you think would be should be on the fourth seat? I, gosh, this, I mean, that's such a tough question. Because, like, I, I'm, I feel like I'm still trying to understand X-Core. Like... I, I think I think part of my disconnect is that I I mean I know that we've been talking about X Core for a long time right before we even finally got this book and so like you know I think in the first issue you know they met they mentioned like a launch and I and I was like oh has X Core not been around this whole time I was thinking like this was the first time they're launching like how do they fit into everything um, but I think this is more of a relaunch and a rebranding and like you know uh, you know I think you mentioned it Rod like they're they're developing further the businesses of Krakoa and like what Krakoa is involved in with the world. And so I just, I don't know because like the, the chemistry of, of what's happening right now with the board just seems so weird to me. Right. Like, so, so right now it's like, okay, are they look, are uh, Monet and Warren looking for board members who really are going to help them? Or are they looking for board members that are going to help the actual organization? Because they've extended uh, invitations to Jamie and to Trinary and they're having meetings with other people. So I'm like, I'm kind of confused. Like, what are they really trying to accomplish with this board? With that sense of confusion, if for no other reason, because I like drama, uh, because like the... <laughs> <laughs> These books are like, well, like drama. Like drama. <laughs> I want to. I want to see another villain get an opportunity to step up, be part of the the board. Because I think going again with optic, yes, you know, you want to put your your best faces forward, but you also want to show the rehabilitation of mutants. And so I think having Mastermind and another villain character would be really cool. Who that could be, I don't know, because already I'm getting kind of a strong Hellfire connection <laughs> with all of these characters. And so I feel like it needs to be someone not Hellfire related. But I mean, I just I don't know what directions they could go with that. I don't I don't know. I you know I would want Celine. She's already been mentioned, um, but that she does give a big Hellfire. Yeah, you know, exactly. Presence, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I did I just don't trust her with Mastermind because she mm -hmm. could easily probably take Angel and Monet. Maybe it, it may be Mo, Monet more than Angel. Maybe mm -hmm. it just maybe not at the same time. Um, but with Mastermind's help, definitely. So oh, yeah. so it's it's and Mastermind is so easy to manipulate. That's all. I mean, he's a coward. <laughs> so, like he's a submissive with a praise kink. Yeah. Yeah. See, there you go. He is. That's that's exactly what he is. He he doesn't stick up for himself that much. And if you praise his power, then he's like, oh, I'm all yours. So that's exactly mm -hmm. that's a good point, Raven. Uh, but if not Celine, if all these meetings are kind of fake outs, which I kind of feel like they were since uh, Roberto was here, because <laughs> no one's going to put Sunspot on anything. I'm sorry. There's not. Um, at least not for this type of thing. He has money. That's what he's used for. That's I it. I am the son of Christina. <laughs> And I honestly, I would want another female anyway, because mm. we already have two men, or nine binary, or what, not a male, you know, anything but another mm. male. So I don't know. I don't know what, what villains that are probably good at business that are that we've seen or we even haven't seen whatever uh enter saber i would love to see someone we haven't seen in a long time like that i think that yeah. would make it more exciting as well you know yeah mix it up but i just for the life of me i can't think of anybody that would be brilliant so i would like to see someone that we haven't seen since like the 90s or 80s everyone just forgot about something just out of the blue and they're like oh yeah that was a villain mutant Oh, cool. Fantasia. There we go. Or is it Stock Fantasia market or, or, man? Who, who who was the character? Maybe maybe I'm getting the name wrong. She she was on the MLF, I think, and she basically mm. was just like a floating cape. Like you didn't really see her body. <laughs> or maybe it was see, it that would be cool. something like that. I, I think know. it was Fantasma. Oh. Oh yeah! Just something random. There we go. That's my. Is that that's god my... awful mask? I know exactly <laughs> who you're talking awful about. Like white hair and just like no body but a cape. It's like if a dominatrix, a matador, <laughs> and an aerobics instructor.
character had a kid. Boom! That's her costume. Like, oh wow. So Raven, you just explained the 90s. Like, <laughs> you did, honestly. You really, really did. Hey guys, if you like that cut from Exus for Podcast, you'll be sure to like some of our other materials. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and check out these other amazing videos here at Exus for Podcast.